future contract that you can download at the end of today. Okay, now I come to iron ore. Iron ore is different. Iron ore used to be regulated, not exactly regulated, but it used to be uh, sold, exchanged in long-term contracts by companies called Valet, BHP, and so on. And steel makers were very happy. They knew that next year they were going to buy uh, iron ore at a given price, the year after, and so on. So they go home early, they don't worry about value at risk, uh, risk management, and so on. And eventually, in 2008, 2009, the three major players called Valet, called BHP Billiton, and called Rio Tinto, came together, they represent 70% of the world production of iron ore which travels, and they say, that's it. We don't like these long-term contracts. We want to go in the first stage to three months uh, quarterly prices, and then monthly, and so on. And now, the minute, so this, this is my forward curve, the minute you have a deregulated market, you have forward and futures contracts. But as you see, since my market is very new, my forward curve is a kind of not too nice. As you see, it is essentially backward dated, but not nice and smooth, because it is a new forward market, and essentially, as always, I am placing the point that I am observing. So my forward curve is not related to any exchange in the uh, in US or in Brazil. It is China, as you know, it is a gigantic consumer of iron ore because it is a gigantic steel maker. And this is the grade, obviously you want to know the purity, and this is the fact that in the price, the cost of freight is included. So there are zillions of details that you need to know. Shipping does matter. Shipping is there. Okay, so that's my iron ore for forward curve. And this is the evolution of iron ore. And as you see, at the time when the big players decided that they did not want any more the long-term contracts, prices went up. They went down somehow lately, but they certainly did not collapse. So iron ore prices are not very much down at the present time. It is a new market, which is followed by different market participants and by myself, because I like to look at new markets in any case. So the title of my talk was supposed to be the relationship between inventory, volatility, and shape of the forward curve, and modestly for my own savings and for my own activities with financial uh, uh, institutions and uh, crude oil and mining companies, I have been fascinated by the proper use of the three elements. So let me briefly mention the story. In general, inventory, which is crucial, is very hard to find. So back in 1949, this brilliant mind said that a proxy for inventory can be found in the spread of the forward curve. When the forward curve goes declining, it means that the spot price is high and inventory is low. Then there was a famous paper by Fama and French who used this proxy in order to test these five uh, base metals. And afterwards, there was these two authors which continue, who continued the same analysis using the same proxy. And then my modest person who decided to use this result in order to go back to the fundamentals. I started with soybeans, with a former PhD student who now is now working in Geneva for a commodity company, and we exhibited, going back to the source of information, a remarkable inv relationship between volatility and one divided by inventory. What I call scarcity is low inventory. Scarcity is high when inventory is low, and we validated modestly this result 
and we went forward with the shape of the forward curve. With another PhD student, I looked at crude oil and natural gas in the US, and we showed that the negative correlation was pretty big at the time of low inventory, typically corn today, typically wheat today. And lastly, uh, in this paper, which is going to appear this year, I did the same with another PhD student to look at the base metals, namely copper, lead, iron, and so on. Again, we collect the inventory, we validate the spread as a measure for inventory, and we study the relationship between inventory and spot price volatility. And as of that point, depending on your job and activity, you may use that the way you want. So I have lots of slides of this nature that I will avoid. I just want to mention that on this one, we measure the inventory not on tons, which does not speak, but in terms of days of world consumption. And as you see in the recent past, the amount of inventory we have got is awfully small, like eight, eight days of world consumption. Yes, five minutes. Okay, so I will uh, rush in order to say whatever I wanted to say. One thing I want to say is the fact that the LME, which is a major exchange for metals, as you know, has awfully reduced its reserves in metals. And here, the Shanghai Futures Exchange, which only started in 2006, has almost the same inventory as the LME. So let me pass on that, and let me just uh, finish my talk with some correlations. Why should we see correlations between different commodities or different asset classes? Obviously, all commodities are continuing to be denominated in dollars. So we have the dollar effect. We have the macro effect, which is going to be discussed today. So, sorry, I don't have time. I was given five minutes, and I want to say a few things which are important in some of the slides. So, first reason of correlation, economic effects. Second effect uh, of, co of uh, correlation, resource competition. And this, I believe, in my guts, traveling the world from Singapore to Chile and Brazil and so on, you have a piece of land. Do you want to get natural gas? Do you want to get crude oil? Do you want to go into agriculture? You have a vessel. How are you, to, you going to use it? And so on and so forth. OK, and again, we are seeing today correlations between quantities which never were correlated in the past, like agricultural and base metals, which is amazingly surprising. Let me continue. Uh, uh, correlations, why? Because we have one commodity used to produce another one. As you know, Valle used to own plenty of bauxite. They continue to do so uh, through the agreement with Hydro, which I will visit in October, which is a major energy company in Norway. In any case, when I produce aluminum, which is a major commodity mentioned by Professor Engel, uh, bauxite is not too volatile. Electricity, by nature, is very volatile. So that's my second source of correlation. Thirdly, I look at food food which is so important for governments which are becoming shaky because of food prices going very high. If I may, I just would like to mention a number. The source is, is the World Bank. In 1960, 1960, the amount of hectares per human being, which could be arable, was 0.45. In 2020, the number of hectares per human being will go to 
So talking about land, we have the ultimate scarcity there and consequently food prices unfortunately will continue to go up and consequently it is something that governments have to keep on their minds. I am a scientific advisor to the European Commission. They, uh, they are unhappy about speculators, but speculators do not create the land scarcity. It is there, and you remember the big spike in 2007, 2008, which had to do with weather elements, nothing to do with the financial crisis. It started again two years ago, and it is starting again today. Uh, corn prices are the highest possible. I am very interested in fertilizers. I've been working uh, on them for like three years. I worked for Morocco, which is a major producer. And unsurprisingly, looking at price trajectory, looking at breaks and, and uh, spillover effects and so on, we, we have the element of the fertilizer index produced by the World Bank, where the peak is uh, six months after the peak in corn and wheat. So there are so many fascinating issues uh, to consider. So in any case, I am looking, I am in Brazil, or I am in London uh, in June, where I spoke at a conference organized by Brazil on sugar and ethanol. I have sugar cane, I can go to sugar, I can go to ethanol, and obviously there is a choice, which is not as bad as in the US, because corn, when it goes into ethanol, is not going to be used by human beings, is not going to be used by animals. Okay, and here, if I may, and I did not produce this slide for the benefit of Brazil, if I look at sugar prices with crude oil, essentially uncorrelated, correlation went up, lately it declined, and if I am not wrong, this proves that the production of ethanol out of sugar did not have any effect on crude oil, since essentially my correlations here are positive and negative. So this slide is the one I did not want to miss, and then I can stop at any moment when uh, the chairman wants me to stop. Uh, <laughs> okay, I had looked at gold, but it will be for another time. Uh, let me stop a minute on that. This is gold implied vol in December 07. Gold prices were high. Some players don't want to buy the spot, don't want to buy the future. They buy call options, and consequently, we have an implied vol which is skewed to the right because the implied vol in call options is higher than in put options. This is December 07. This is December 08. More than ever do financial players want to buy options, call options on gold. And maybe the last one, June 2012. Today, I, we have many players, like my mother's person, who are long physical gold and who want to protect their positions by put options. And my implied role, smile, is skewed to the left. So I am going to stop here and whatever. Take questions. Thank you for your time. So I have time for questions, please. I want just to uh, question this um, data that you gave, uh, uh, the number of hectares per person. And um, uh, the point is that the productivity in agriculture has gone up uh, very fast. So land is not as much as important. Like in Brazil, we had uh, land uh, in the last uh, decade uh, increased by maybe 60% and production went up by four folds. So land is not as important in, in, the, in agriculture. In, production anymore. Uh, I um, kindly 
totally disagree with you. I think that land is so important and I have children and I have PhD students and I care about the world and when I read in a document produced by the World Bank or the FAO that the number of arable hectares per human being is going to be divided by more than half when at the same time we have weather events like the one we have this year. My husband is from Chicago. It is terrible over there because of the drought. I absolutely disagree with you and precisely, if I may, I, uh, what you said uh, was absolutely the same conclusion I had in a study I uh, achieved for Bungi about a year ago looking at land valuation in Brazil, in the US, and the remarkable rise in the price of land. All my friends who are wealthy doctors in Paris are buying land in Brazil, in Argentina, because there is no land available in France, which is too small, so they go to countries which are lucky to own large pieces of land. But if I may keep your land for yourself, it will be very valuable 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Professor, how do you see the financialization of iron ore and the advent of iron ore as a, co a global commodity? Uh, I modestly believe that it is going to happen what happened everywhere. Uh, my, my life in, in commodities started with crude oil, but in any case, shortly after that, did I go to electricity. In my second country, I was working in Atlanta in uh, the trading uh, desk of uh, a utility producing uh, electricity, natural gas, and so on. And when I was going back to my first country called France, we have a gigantic company called Electricité de France. And they did not want deregulation of electricity markets. I was proposing them to build an index in order to build derivatives and so on, and they just refused. They wanted to keep the lives of their old days, and they refused, and they refused, and they refused. Finally, Germany got deregulated, the northern part of Europe uh, much before. Finally, France got deregulated, and today, when you want to find liquidity in electricity or natural gas derivatives in Europe, you don't go to France, unfortunately, you go to Germany, the European Electricity Index, or you go to the North Pole. So what is my, my statement? My statement is that iron ore will be the same story. It is the same story for fertilizers. It is the same story for any class of commodities. They become deregulated because at least one category of players has a benefit in that. The minute, at least if you have both players, buyers and sellers, it's perfect. You get immediately deregulation and so-called free markets. But if you have one party, at least, which benefits from that, it will happen. And it has started and it will continue. So we will have shortly forward curves which will be smoother. It will happen. They did not exist before. You have companies called the Steel Index. It comes out of the blue. The company is called the Steel Index. Why is it so? Because they want to create derivatives which need an underlying index to define the payoff at maturity. And we are seeing iron ore indexes. And as you see, China, Singapore are ahead of Brazil, sorry, and Europe in designing new indexes related to iron ore and so on. Hi, uh, we have seen the convenience field in the model, in the arbitrage based model, and some people say that it's difficult to evaluate what is the convenience field prevailing. And people say that the spot price is mispriced or the future is mispriced, so there is an ambiguous field in this place. So my question is, uh, in the arbitrage based models, and is usually you have restriction for short selling, especially agriculture, we see that a lot in Brazil. You can't short sell soybeans f for the case. So, uh, what, 
how can we apply this arbitrage based model for commodities? Because sometimes it's, it's, there is a duality in a consumption good and asset. Okay, if I may, just in a nutshell, not to take everybody too long, what do I want to say? No arbitrage, as we know, because of credit and so on, has to be reviewed because of the funds that you need to deposit and so on. But I don't need anything complicated. I just need two liquid forward contracts. Forget S. I don't know S. It is opaque. But I believe that in the same way I have this relationship in the forex market, I have it in the world of commodities. I take two liquid forward contracts, and they do exist. If they don't, don't touch it. Never touch a commodity market where you can't find two liquid contracts with two different maturities. You write this equality two times, like your young brother in high school. You have a system with two equations with two unknown. You derive S and you derive Y. So consequently, you have an easy way to derive your convenience yield from two liquid forward contracts. If you have 10, it's even better. You do some minimization of least squares and so on and you extract little y, and you extract s, and you build your internal forward curve for maturities which go beyond the ones which are traded on the exchange. So I would say that it is absolutely doable, and it is done every day, in particular, I'm sure, at the, in a place called Valley and other places. We can discuss that further uh, during the, the coffee break, if you will. So now we have a session with Ezra Prasad and Thierry Verdier. And uh, they're both sitting here, and uh, they will be the chair of their own session and control the time of questions, too. So uh, please welcome uh, both of them. Good morning. Now that you're all stoked up on coffee and sugar, it's a good time for a change of pace, first from empirical work to theory, and second, and perhaps more importantly, from the practical aspects of financial markets to the practical aspects of central banking, both of which can be analytically interesting and these days pretty intimidating as well. So what I'm going to talk about is actually some work that I've been doing for a while trying to understand um, in theoretical context how central banks, and in particular, central banks in emerging markets should deal with commodity price volatility. And in particular, I'll be focusing on food price volatility. Now, unlike academic economists, central bankers are much more wise. They have been, in a sense, doing the right thing in terms of taking into account commodity price volatility. So some of what I'll be talking about today is actually a case of theory catching up with practice. But this is important because ultimately, if one wants to think about analytical frameworks, if one wants to think about practical policy making, you do need good theory as a grounding. So I think it's important to think about models that are able to grapple with the complexities that central bankers typically face day to day. I'm very honored to be in the presence of such a distinguished set of speakers, and I'm very grateful to uh, Huao and Roberto for giving me the opportunity. Um, and usually when I come to Rio, it's to talk about China, so it's a good pleasure also to be talking about central banking for a change. So what this um, research program essentially keys off is this notion that all central banks, no matter whether or not they have inflation targeting as their operating frameworks, view low and stable inflation as the primary objective of monetary policy. Now, the difficult issue arises when, in terms of thinking about the choice of price index. 
what is the right price index that a central bank should target when it's thinking about targeting um, inflation. Now, once you mention this issue, there's a very broad range of very difficult and important operational issues that need to be dealt with. What the level of the inflation target ought to be, whether it should be a point or a band, what the right horizon for targeting inflation is. And this, of course, sits within an even broader set of questions. But as academics, we can really make progress only by honing in on very specific questions. So I'm going to focus on this very specific question right now. If a central bank views low and stable inflation as the primary objective of monetary policy, what is the right price index to target? And as I will argue, this is going to be a very important question that helps to basically illustrate the complexities of central banking, especially in emerging markets. Now, it turns out that academic theory has dealt with this issue before, and there is a very clear and precise answer. And that clear and precise answer is basically that a central bank should target core inflation. Now, why is this? Because food and energy, supply, uh, energy price shocks are considered as basically supply shocks. So responding to supply shocks with monetary policy in virtually any class of models is usually not a good idea. And there is a very strong theoretical basis for this as well um, that Marvin Goodfriend, um, Aoki, and so on have put forward. And again, it's a very compelling result. And the idea is as follows, that monetary policy can do a lot of good, but it can also do a lot of damage. But this is a very constrained view of monetary policy, that the best that monetary policy can do is to basically replicate the flexible price equilibrium. And once you put it that way, the answer is blindingly obvious, that what the central bank can do, indeed the only thing it should attempt to do is to replicate the flexible price equilibrium by getting the sticky part of the economy, or the sticky price part of the economy, to behave as though it had flexible prices. So you don't deal with the flexible price part of the economy, and you try to use your monetary policy instrument in order to get the, fixed, uh, the rigid price part of the economy to behave as if it had flexible prices. So this was a very clear and compelling result that was out there, and it's guided a lot of work in monetary theory. So essentially what the paper I'm going to talk about today will do will show that in a very simple class of models that this result was built on, you can actually overturn this result once you introduce complete markets. And this is one important feature of the previous literature, that there was a distortion in these models, but the only distortion was price stickiness in a part of the economy. Um, and I'm going to argue that once you introduce incomplete markets, that is going to change. Now, as we know, markets are far from complete. Even in the US, there is a lot of evidence that consumers behave as if they are credit constrained. And in fact, a lot of this work cited here finds that about 50% of consumers, even in the US, behave as though they are credit constrained. That is, they don't uh, follow the tenets of the permanent income hypothesis according to which you should be trying to smooth consumption. But in fact, they behave like rule of thumb consumers, essentially consuming their labor income uh, in most periods. Now, you would think that if an advanced economy shows this sort of behavior, it's going to be much more of an issue for emerging markets. And indeed, if you look at one measure of financial access, which is the amount of access to a formal financial institution, you immediately see a quantum difference between emerging markets where the median ratio for a large group of emerging markets uh, of access to formal finance is about 44% of households. It's a little more than double that for the emerging markets. So it seems fairly clear that the notion of incomplete markets is going to be important, not just for the advanced economies, but especially so for the emerging markets where this is really going to bite. So the objective of this paper is basically, again, very limited. Um, it's to analytically determine the right price index that an inflation targeting central bank should be looking at. Now, I should make it very clear that in this paper, we are not looking at optimal policy rules. What we're trying to look at is a class of practical and implementable policy rules and try to evaluate them based on a welfare criterion, which I will be very specific. So in a sense, again, it's a matter of theory catching up to what central banks actually do.
Now, financial frictions turn out to have a very important um, uh, implication in these theoretical models. That they do matter f for uh, consumption choice in a very, very um, uh, important way. And it's going to um, have a couple of further implications that the income and expenditure of households is going to depend upon the composition of household expenditure and also on certain elasticities that turn out to be very important. Now, why do I bring up these issues? Here again, it turns out there is a very important difference uh, between emerging markets and advanced economies. And the reason I emphasize this difference again is that a lot of monetary theory is based not just on complete markets, but many parametrizations that are especially relevant for advanced economies. And for emerging markets, um, uh, as I've been thinking in my research program, there is really a very significant set of differences that need to be taken into account even in a theoretical formulation. So here is one very important example, which is clearly going to matter a great deal when one thinks about food prices and how they should affect monetary policy choices. If you look at the share of um, um, uh, household expenditure in uh, emerging markets that's attributed to food, it's substantially greater than um, in advanced economies. Now, there is the Engels law, not uh, the famous Engels sitting before us, but a different Engel who posited that within an economy, um, there is a, a negative relationship between the income level of a household and how much that household expends on food as a share of its total expenditure. It turns out that relationship also holds across countries. So if you look at a broad range of countries with log real GDP per capita on the um, x-axis, you can see that there is a very clear negative relationship between the amount on average of uh, um, food expenditures as a share of total household expenditures um, in their economy. So this again is going to matter because if you think about a central bank now facing monetary policy decisions and going with the classical result that you shouldn't use monetary policy to do anything about food price changes, clearly it becomes very untenable not just economically, but more importantly, politically and socially, when about 40% of the average household's consumption basket, and that share, of course, is much greater for poor households, uh, when you have that much of co uh, consumption expenditures going to food. But there are other aspects that are equally important in terms of modeling choices. If you look at the income elasticity of the demand for food, again, it turns out to be much higher for the um, emerging markets or developing economies. At lower levels of per capita income, income elasticity of the demand for food turns out to be much higher. Again, you can think about intuitively why this is so, because um, um, as your income levels rise, uh, typically you tend to move away from food consumption towards other types of consumption. And equally importantly, the price elasticity of the demand for food actually turns out to be quite low in the um, advanced economy, in the emerging markets. Again, much of the parametrization in the existing literature has used the parameters that we see for the um, uh, advanced economies, and this turns out not quite to be right. Um, so what I'm going to do is to show a model that basically incorporates a number of features that are relevant to emerging markets. Uh, incomplete markets. Now, this is one feature that I will argue is important, not just for the emerging markets, but for a much broader group of economies that have financial frictions, including the advanced economies. But in addition, subsistence level food consumption, a low elasticity of the substitution for food, um, and uh, a share of expenditure on um, uh, food that is rather high. Uh, to make things simple, I'm going to work with a closed economy setting where there is no physical capital. Um, it complicates things a lot once one introduces physical capital in terms of the dynamics of the model, uh, but I have done some of those exercises. It turns out not to fundamentally alter the results, although it, it does um, uh, influence them. So basically, what this uh, initial stage of this research program does through this paper is basically provide an indication of how analytically one might go about determining the appropriate choice of price index um, in an economy with financial frictions. And as I've um, uh, argued and will continue to argue, this is not really just about emerging markets or low-income economies. It's much more broadly relevant for economies with financial frictions. So let's start by thinking about the model. Um, 
it's a, a two-sector economy with uh, uh, two goods. So I'm going to use this notion of food to represent all flexible price goods in the economy. Now it turns out that even food doesn't have very flexible prices. A lot of micro evidence shows that um, uh, if you look at the frequency of adjustment for food prices, it's somewhere in the range of one to three months. One might argue about whether that's flexible or not. In an economy where you think about one period as one quarter, it is pretty flexible. But virtually all other uh, commodities, um, industrial goods, and especially services, turn out to be much less flexible. Um, so I'm going to use this somewhat unfortunate term, non-food, to encompass all the um, non-flexible, uh, that is rigid price goods in the economy. So one can think about this as relative price flexibility, and for the purposes of this model, to make the modeling cleaner, I'm going to view the food prices as being completely flexible and non-food prices as having a specific type of rigidity. So there will be just one type of flexible price good in this model and a continuum of uh, monopolistically produced um, sticky price goods. There will be two types of households in this economy, um, both of which are uh, infinitely lived. Um, a unit measure of households that don't face any liquidity constraints, that is, they're able to access financial markets in order to smooth consumption over time. And um, a measure lambda of households that, do, uh, that face uh, a liquidity constraint, and they don't have a storage technology here because there is no capital in this model, and I don't allow for storage, again, just to make things cleaner. Um, and that is the fraction of households that basically has to consume its labor income in every period. Um, now, this utility function of a standard form, except we introduce one um, twist. And this twist is basically that people have to eat. Now, you might think that the notion that people have to eat would be, again, blindingly obvious to anybody but an economist. But it turns out in a theoretical model, once you introduce the notion that people have to eat, it actually has a very powerful implication. So what we do in this uh, um, setup is basically have a CES aggregator over this continuum of um, uh, sticky price goods. And with the food um, commodity, there is a subsistence level of consumption. That is, you got to eat. If you don't eat, uh, basically you die. So the infinitely lived household has to respect this constraint. Now, why does this constraint matter? Again, it seems very obvious and very simplistic, but it turns out to be important because even though this constraint does not bind in equilibrium, it turns out it does affect the elasticity of substitution between food and non-food. In other words, when the price of food changes or when your income changes, there is a limit to how much you can substitute away from food to non-food. So you, can, you can't move away from eating to having um, the best uh, winter coat, or in the case of uh, uh, Rio, I guess the best bikini uh, around, because that doesn't do it for you. You have to eat a certain amount, and that does affect the uh, elasticity of substitution between food and non-food that turns out to be very important. So the constrained households basically have to maximize utility uh, based on how much they work, which is N, the wage that they earn in the food sector, um, and this constraint that they have to eat a certain amount of food. Um, and uh, basically, they have to um, respect these constraints, whereas the um, unconstrained households also have to eat, but from their point of view, they have this luxury of being able to use uh, financial markets to smooth consumption over time. So in good times, they don't have to uh, get as much of non-food. They can basically use it uh, to save up for the next period. Um, the production technologies are fairly standard, so I won't spend very much time talking about them. It's a very simple linear technology. Um, the firms in the sticky price sector, again, are going to um, uh, produce using a fairly uh, straightforward technology. Now, the issue is that the shocks are going to be the uh, same across all households, and we're going to have um, a staggered price setting um, of the Calvo form. That is, a certain fraction of firms adjust prices in every period. So. So far, in addition to the features that I've laid out, most of the uh, formulation of the model is actually pretty standard. And that's very important from my point of view, because it's important for me to show you that I can overturn the classical result, not because I've done funky things with the model. Um, in fact, it turns out the classical model can be nested within the somewhat more complicated model I've created. And in addition, I'm going to go through each of these features of the model or at least the paper does, 
and show you that uh, which of these is quantitatively relevant. And it turns out that um, the financial frictions are going to be the most relevant uh, um, uh, distortion that I introduce into this model. Now, the monetary policy rule is a fairly uh, straightforward uh, Taylor rule formulation where the, um, in its most general form, the central bank cares about um, um, the deviation between inflation and the uh, desired or target inflation rate, and also the output gap, which is the deviation of output from its trend. And also, the central bank doesn't want to use its policy instrument, the interest rate, too aggressively. That is, it tries to smooth interest rates over time. Now, why do I have this interest rate smoothing? It turns out central banks do smooth interest rates. There is a lot of uh, empirical evidence and uh, uh, practical um, uh, evidence also that this is the way central banks work, that they don't want to move interest rates too aggressively. Um, so there is uh, um, an uncorrelated set of shocks hitting the flexible price sector uh, and the sticky price sector. So again, nothing uh, terribly um, uh, path-breaking here. So what we're going to do, uh, what I'm going to do here is basically talk about welfare in a very specific context. And the way I've set up the model, I can talk not just about aggregate welfare, but also about welfare distributions between the households that do have um, this liquidity constraint and those that don't. Um, so the conditional welfare in this model is going to be um, aggregated over all of these uh, uh, households. And it's basically going to be um, uh, a function of the two types of households total welfare. So the uh, measure of households that are credit constrained is one, uh, I'm sorry, is lambda. Uh, and those that are not credit constrained is measure one. Now, in the basic version of the model, I'm going to do one thing again, which lines up with empirical uh, evidence that all the households that are credit constrained are going to be in the food producing sector. And again, why do I do this? It makes the model cleaner, turns out as I will show you later, not to be crucial for the results. But again, this is consistent with what we see in the data. If you go back to the financial access data that I showed you earlier, um, that same World Bank source sh shows that if you look at the amount of access that rural households have versus um, uh, urban households, there is about a 20 to 30 percentage point difference um, in advanced, in uh, emerging markets and low income economies. In advanced economies, there isn't that much of a difference between the two. So again, it seems intuitive to think about rural households as being the ones that are most subject um, to this credit constraint. Um, so we're going to look at two settings, a complete financial market setting and an incomplete market setting. So the complete market setting basically allows me to replicate the classical result. Why? Because once you allow the credit constrained households to have the same access to financial markets as the unconstrained households, basically that is the classical model that people have worked with. And I can shut down all the other frictions in the model. In fact, it turns out that even when I don't shut down all the other frictions, I can show the classical result. And as I said, I'm not going to look for the optimal um, uh, uh, choice of policies. Within this class of rules, I'm going to try to see what rule is going to dominate. Now, it turns out that I can do a little more, which I do, where um, you can look at the optimal parameters for each of these rules. Again, virtually all of the results go through, even when I pick optimal parameters for each of these rules using a grid search. But it's going to be a very standard set of policy rules. One is strict core inflation targeting. Central bank cares about core inflation, nothing else. Uh, or strict headline inflation targeting. Again, the central bank doesn't care about the output gap. All it cares about inflation. Um, so it's a very strict inflation targeter. Um, and all it cares about is the deviation of inflation from trend or flexible core inflation targeting where the central bank cares about the deviation of inflation from trend, but only uses the core measure of inflation here, and also the output gap. Um, or what is the most flexible approach, which is thinking about uh, targeting inflation, but putting some weight on the output gap and using the headline CPI measure rather than the core CPI measure. Um, if you take um, a number of economies like Brazil, for instance, what Brazil does is basically to target headline inflation. And it's very difficult, even for a pure inflation targeting central bank, to completely ignore uh, employment. Uh, 
Um, the uh, Fed has a dual mandate with employment written in, but even with Bernanke announcing an inflation target, clearly the central bank is under pressure to think about uh, employment objectives. The European Central Bank, of course, has a lot of other headaches to deal with, but again, uh, it does have an inflation target and it is being forced to think about other um, uh, issues, including uh, output. Uh, so this, in a sense, may be the more practical thing to think about, although what a pure inflation targeting central bank is looking at is technically this one, with the interest rate smoothing um, uh, being there in all four rules. So I'm going to use the welfare and the strict core inflation targeting as a baseline, because as you can sort of gather just by the choice of words, the more flexible a central bank is, the better the welfare outcome it should be able to deliver. Um, so the welfare cost um, that I'm going to think about is the amount that is needed to make consumers as well off under a strict core inflation targeting regime compared to the alternatives. Um, so the way I've set it up is basically that a positive number is going to show um, that alternative rules, that is rules other than strict core inflation targeting, are going to be welfare improving. Um, so the positive number indicates that things are going to be better under alternative rules. I could spend half an hour talking about the parametrization, and usually at an academic seminar, this is where the whole thing grinds to a halt, because everybody has their own favorite parameter, and you have to spend time discussing this. So um, the approach we take in the paper is to use fairly standard parameter choices um, taken from the micro evidence, and then we do a bunch of robustness tests in the paper, an extensive set of robustness tests, to go over each of the key parameters and try to see whether the parameter that we have chosen drives the results in any way. It turns out, again, that it's not crucial for the results. I'll give you some flavor of those as we uh, go along. So what do we find? First of all, it's important to show that, again, the model that we have set up is not some weird model um, that basically overturns the classical result even when we shut down financial frictions. So when I use the parametrizations um, that I just flashed before you, when I use the other settings uh, in the model that are relevant to emerging markets, but then make markets complete, then it turns out the classical result holds. That if you look at any of the alternative rules, they give you a worse welfare outcome compared to core inflation targeting. So the classical result holds. That core inflation targeting is the best thing that monetary policy can do. But once you close financial markets with this particular form of market incompleteness that I've laid out, things change. And in fact, there's a pretty significant um, welfare gain, even if you go to flexible core inflation targeting, but the greatest gain, um, and this in terms of lifetime consumption is about 4%, which is really a, a huge amount. Um, uh, that is the amount of welfare gain that you get if the central bank targets um, headline CPI with some weight on the output gap. So essentially what is happening here is that the central bank is able to do um, one very important thing, which is that by targeting headline inflation, it is able to take account of the fact that households in the food sector, because they're credit constrained, are going to respond in a very different way to food price shocks. And I'm going to focus in um, much of the analysis on a very specific shock, because you can have aggregate shocks in the model, you can have shocks in the flexible price sector, but it's the shock to the, rigid, uh, to the flexible price sector, sorry, that are really important, because here again is where the classical result has the most bite. Because what the classical result says is that when you get a food price shock, um, it's a supply shock, usually it's a transitory shock, you don't want the central bank doing anything. Um, and there is some logic to this. Um, if I take my own economy, India, for instance, the central bank is in a very difficult spot. It's having to respond to food price increases, and um, as we heard from the earlier presentations, food prices are uh, a potential game changer both economically and politically, not just in the emerging markets, but also in the advanced economies. But given the share of high expenditure on food in emerging markets, particularly so in emerging markets, um, so what happens if the households in that sector were not to get uh, um, uh, any monetary policy response when there is a food productivity shock. Now, when you get a food productivity shock, a negative food productivity shock, food prices rise. Now, the interesting thing is that this is bad 
if you think about the amount of money that households have to spend on food, especially that they have to eat. But remember, the guys in the food sector are working in the food sector, and when prices for food rise, they're actually going to do better. Uh, but they can't use this good time to basically save for the future because they have no access to financial markets. So that essentially is the key um, aspect of the result. So if you go back to the complete market setting, again, you can see what happens. If you get um, a negative shock to food productivity, uh, which is a transitory shock, food output goes back to where it was, non-food output falls, rises, and then returns. So what the central bank does in this setting um, is basically uh, with strict core inflation targeting is to do nothing because the central bank should not be responding to this food price shock. If it was targeting headline inflation, what it does, it raises interest rates because um, the food, food is a very important part of the CPI, again, especially in emerging markets. So it raises interest rates and that kills non-food output. Um, so headline inflation rises and then takes a big um, dip because of the monetary policy response. And basically, you have these negative effects on output and consumption in both um, uh, of these settings. Um, what happens with the um, uh, uh, setting with um, strict core inflation targeting is that output falls because of, um, uh, of the negative shock, but then it rises back up. And this is aggregate output. So it doesn't um, uh, hurt you very much more. But with uh, strict headline inflation targeting, because the central bank responds, the fall in output and the fall in consumption is much greater when you have complete markets. So here the central bank is doing what it shouldn't be doing. But if you look at the same shock, a negative shock to food productivity, but now in an economy where there are incomplete markets, then you can see that things change quite significantly. Now if you look at the wage of the food sector households, which again is sort of crucial here, the wage tends to spike up when you have strict core inflation targeting. Why? Because the central bank says, I don't care about food prices. I'm just targeting core inflation. So food prices rise. And as a consequence, the income or the wages of food sector household rises. And that drives up aggregate demand. Um, and eventually, the um, uh, central bank is forced to respond even more aggressively. So it turns out that when you have incomplete markets, because most of these constrained households are in the agricultural sector, good times to them are when you have a negative food productivity shock. Um, so while it's bad times for the rest of the economy, it turns, it turns out it's good times for the food sector. And if the central bank doesn't respond, it turns out to have negative effects on the rest of the economy. So basically what is happening here is that the constrained households demand is not really sensitive to interest rate fluctuations. Why is that? Because they're constrained. Um, they don't have access uh, to the uh, formal financial markets. And it's determined by prices and wages in the food sector. So this financial friction establishes this very important link between the real income of constrained consumers and aggregate demand. So effectively, what is happening is that the price in the flexible sector, price sector, ends up affecting aggregate demand in a very important way. Why? Because the food price households, I mean the food households have a lot more income, so they spend more on food, but they also spend more on other stuff. Um, because again, they have to eat, but beyond the point, um, uh, given the elasticity of substitution, you do get uh, benefits from consuming other goods. So overall, demand does tend to rise. So you also have this curious phenomenon that with incomplete markets, you can get inflation and output essentially moving in uh, opposite directions. Now, I argued um, that this model has a lot of new features. Which one really matters? So what we do here is to look at each of these features, breaking them down or shutting them off, to make sure that what we've done to make the model match emerging market setting is not driving the results. So we drop the subsistence level of food consumption. Um, we change the elasticity of substitution between uh, food and non-food items. And we do a whole bunch of other sensitivity tests. So the uh, paper, which is available as an NBR working paper, is replete with a um, table showing all of this. And it turns out not to matter uh, a great deal. The financial frictions are really critical to this. Now, what about the financial frictions themselves? It turns out here um, one has to be careful, because what uh, 
different people think about when they think about complete markets is very different. So again, in an academic seminar, the moment I say complete markets, um, this is a question, what do you mean by complete markets? And it's a fair question. Uh, because you can have different types of completeness. And I've set out a very particular type of market incompleteness that a certain fraction of households in the economy don't have access to either a saving technology or access to formal uh, finance. Um, so you can think about different types of complete market setting. And you can also think about settings where it's not just households in the food sector, but maybe households in the non-food sector that are also credit constrained. Uh, because after all, if you can have labor mobility from the food to the non-food sector, maybe the results are going to go away. Um, so first, let's talk about an alternative market setting. In most complete markets models, basically, you can write ex-ante insurance contracts that insure you against which sector you're going to be in. Um, that is, it's not based on your uh, primogenitor or um, what your parents used to be doing. Um, whether you end up in the agricultural sector or the non-food sector. So basically, you can write contracts that not only insure you against income risk in each sector, but also insure you against the fact that you may end up becoming a farmer when you would much rather hang out in Rio and be uh, an industrialist. Um, so when you have this more um, uh, complete markets, um, uh, you, of course, essentially um, can get away from this constraint that I've laid out. But you can think of a more limited setting where you do have access to financial markets, but only after um, you have been assigned to a particular sector. So it's a limited form of market completeness where you can insure, but only after you've been assigned to a particular sector. And here again, it turns out that unless you have a very large elasticity of substitution between food and non-food, uh, basically the results go through. Um, and why does this elasticity matter so much? Again, if you think about the food sector households, let's say, negative food productivity shock, food prices rise. If you can substitute away from food to non-food very easily, what would you do? You wouldn't consume as much food. You'd shift away to non-food. Meanwhile, the households in the other sector who are not benefiting from the food price increases, they'd basically switch away from food to non-food. So then you get this offsetting effect, which basically um, drives this down. But these are unrealistic parameter values, it turns out. In fact, um, um, it's more likely that the parameter value that you find in the microdata is somewhere below 0.6. Um, and finally, we look at what happens if you have a fraction of people in either sector who are credit constrained. So basically what we do is we set the amount of people in the economy that have credit constraints at half and just distribute them between the two sectors. So here we assume that 10% um, of the people who have um, uh, uh, access to formal finance um, are in the uh, sticky price sector. Remember, in the baseline case, this number is zero, this number is one. So we split it between the two again. It turns out not to matter a great deal. So again, the overall financial friction is what matters a great deal. So basically, what we conclude from this particular um, paper is that in the presence of financial frictions, core inflation targeting is not optimal because once you have credit constrained consumers, that affects how productivity shocks as well as monetary policy responses affect um, aggregate demand.